Hey, welcome to Tank Talk. I'm your host, Bob Tanker. And this evening's guest, our honored guest, we have Senator Julian Sear. Glad to okay. be here, Dr. Tanker. Thank you for having us. And we have State Representative Dillian Fernandez. Terrific to be here, Doctor. Good, Good to man. see you. Good Good guy. Guy. Good Great man. to be back. Listen, listen, you know one thing? When we did this a long time ago, it seems like, and, <laughs> and, and, and for you guys, it must seem like, Phew. but tell us, how was your first year? Uh, do you well, want to start? It's, it, it's eight months. Okay. So, so we, we uh, both Dylan and I were sworn in in early January okay. uh, 2017. So now we, we, we finished eight months. We're on to our ninth. Um, and it's been just a tremendous honor. Um, a real, uh, it's really, it's really a, a privilege to be able to represent the people of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and Cape Cod uh, and, and to have a real opportunity. So we've been having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been able to get some things done, which I think is, is really important. Is it as important. challenging as you... As you thought it would be? <laughs> there is, you know, it's, it's, you know, Julian and I campaigned uh -huh. uh, really hard, and we were out across the district. Right. Julian's district is a lot bigger than mine, <laughs> but I have probably the most unique district of any oh, uh, state yeah. rep because it's, you know, half of Falmouth, all of Nantucket, okay. all of Dukes really? County. We're actually going to be on Cuddy Hunk tomorrow. We're going to, <laughs> yeah, we have Cuddy Hunk as well in Elizabeth Island. And so it's, but, but when you're campaigning, when you're knocking on doors across the district, you're always traveling around and you really get used to the, the travel involved mm -hmm. and the, the logistics involved. And so that actually didn't come as a surprise. But in terms of this first year, you know, we've, we've continued that commitment to community engagement and transparency and coming on to shows like this, but also having community forums across the district. Do you travel together district. a lot? We do. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think because uh, you know, it, it's a far-flung district, certainly, and want to provide opportunities. Uh, but you also divide and conquer. Uh, but we've had community meetings here on island. I think our, the first one we did was in February, and it was on a Sunday with a Pats mm -hmm. game, and we still had 300 mm. people who showed up. Super Bowl people on Super Bowl on Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday. You're kidding me. Yeah, I mean, we were, we're the most shocked. We were shocked. You know, you walk in and you're like, "Wow, 300 people are giving us their afternoon on Super Bowl Sunday." But I, I think that. You know, for, there's been a real re-engagement of folks. Folks are mm -hmm. really see what's going on in the world, are really concerned, and, and want to be in and want to be involved. And I you think know, we've I seen can't help I can't help to say, but people under the situation that we're under right now, I think people are more engaged than than probably ever before, um, and they want to be a part of what decision make. It's yeah. it's their life. Mm -hmm. It's their life. You know what I mean? Which um, I think is good. I mean, I, th I think we need right. I mean, we we for for our representative democracy to mm -hmm. thrive, right? You need folks who are engaged. You know, you got six islands, one town. I mean, it's six, six towns, one island, excuse me. Right. Um, you know, involved in our town, in our town right. meetings, public, you know, at the, uh, the state level. Uh, and folks want to plug in to where mm -hmm. they can have a difference. And so we've and been frankly, able to do that. And frankly, I think it helps. You mm -hmm. know, it helps us uh, as advocates of the mm -hmm. state house mm -hmm. when you have a really strong base of people, right, right. a really strong base of mm -hmm. residents advocating for the same issues mm -hmm. that you're fighting for. And, you know, we we just came from uh, this this clean energy summit. We have a a, a ton of advocates in our district right. advocating for 100% renewable energy, advocating for a carbon tax and the like. And so for us, you know, we're advocating for this on the state level, but right. when we have that grassroots group also pitching in, also making right. phone calls and sending letters, that really complements our work. So I think, you know, what we're seeing in Washington right now is, you know, a national embarrassment and a disaster. The, the, if we're going to take away something good from it is that a lot of people are deeply engaged in the issues right now. And mm -hmm. so on the state level, we're trying to harness that as best we can to make something move. Uh, when you, when you talk about clean energy mm -hmm. and you still have people out there talking about coal and, 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 and fuel and whatnot, and it's been proven, you know, in my neighborhood, you know, in my neighborhood, we have about three or four houses within the last two years to put up solar panels. Yep. You know, lady across the street. Yeah. And these people don't have a great deal of money, but they're investing in these solar panels, you know. So, you know, and lady across the street told me, she says, well, Bobby, you know, in, in four years, I'm not going to pay, pay any electric. That's right. Even here at the station, we put panels yep. up, and our electric bill has been next to zero when I mean, you sell it back to the, to the main. How, how are you running into any discourse with the opposite side? And what kind of... So, so there, I, I think in Massachusetts, we've been mm -hmm. on the leading edge of clean energy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, coal, there's a lot of conversation about coal nationally, 
Um, we have one coal power plant that actually went offline three months ago. It was the last one in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, the conversation, a lot of conversation in the state around offshore wind, uh, likely going to be the leader here, uh, you know, south of the island uh, around offshore wind projects. I'd say um, the last four days, if we'd had that, yeah. those things up, we, we wouldn't have had to pay electric bills for about six, six years. <laughs> no, I think when it, gets really windy, when it gets really windy, I think, I think they shut them down. But um, there has been, especially you mentioned, um, solar panels and the demand for solar panels on homes. I mean, I saw this, and, and Dylan, you saw this as well. You know, if you're knocking doors, you could. It's amazing how many people have solar panels right. um, all across. You know, on the Mid Cape, on the Outer Cape, right. here on the island. Uh, and so I think that one of the barriers to that, though, is um, there. There's a, a, a cap basically that the state puts on. Uh, net metering, right? So mm -hmm. you mentioned right, how, right, right, how right. the station right is able right, to basically right. have a zero right, electricity right. bill. Uh, utilities are kind of mm -hmm. keeping keeping the cap on that. Right. Uh, we're pushing to expand that, right? I think more and more people should have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there is there is some opposition. I, I think we've done uh, a good job in Massachusetts, but we can't rest on our laurels. And I think this is what the, the Energy Summit with Vineyard mm -hmm. Power this morning, um, the Community Empowerment Bill that we've both filed, mm -hmm. basically to give municipalities and communities a say in opting in mm -hmm. uh, to to clean energy, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to really keep that up. Um, not only so we stay a leader, but you know, really to address. Where's the vineyard leading, Nantucket? Where are we going? So where, the, what are we yeah. leaning towards? Mm. What are you pushing us uh, and helping us, advising us to say this is where you guys should be going? Yeah, well, on where? the and on uh, to stay on the kind of climate clean energy piece of uh -huh. that. You know, we are going to see uh, the biggest deep water offshore wind project in our nation's history, mm -hmm. 14 miles south of the vineyard. I mean, we're gonna be a nation leader when it comes to uh, renewable deep water offshore wind. And this is in an area that has been deemed the windiest place in America. Mm -hmm. People call it the Saudi Arabia right, of wind, right, right, which right. I think is a little <laughs> off message, right? Maybe we don't wanna make it but the point, the point, the point remains the same, which is, you know, this is such a great energy generator. Uh -huh. It's renewable, and it's something that, that the island specifically is going to be a part of. And to get to your point about neighbors, you know, putting up solar panels, you know, that that didn't that doesn't happen by accident, right? That happens because Massachusetts has some terrific solar tax credits okay. that we need to extend. And so we're we as a state are are making residents aware that you know. I know a lot of people who aren't environmental advocates right. who put solar panels up on their roofs because they're going to save energy well, and they're going to save on their electricity bill. Right. And that's what we as, as a government need to be doing is incentivizing things that help our environment long term, our economy long term, our public health long term. And that's what's so important about advancing this on the state level. Well, we, when we put um, the uh, solar panels on here. Yep. Uh, we had long conversations with our board. I'm on the board and we had a long conversation. And we brought the people in and everything else. We would have been foolish, truly foolish not to do that. <laughs> I'm talking about truly not to. Now, I don't know, because I'm not here every day. Carl would probably know. I don't know if we paid an electric bill. But I know we got a lot of stuff stored up. Yeah. You got a lot you of know, lights on. A <laughs> lot of lights on. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, <this> these <laughs> are not all, all the time. But, you know, we, you know, it's, yeah. it's a lot. When people talk about costs, we say, well, what is it going to save me? If a person went out to say, I, I want to put on my roof, how, how do they get that without putting them in the poor bank? So that you want to... Sure. I, I, you know, when I was in the attorney general's office, I mm -hmm. put together uh, their, their solar buying guide. Mm -hmm. And so there's really three options, three main options. One, you can buy them outright, right? right? And that, that, the problems with that is there's a high upfront cost mm -hmm. associated with it. But if you do it, you own them. Right. Or you can, the, the next major thing that people do is lease them. And so a company comes in, puts them on your roof, and then, uh, and then they own the solar panel and but and you don't get any of their solar tax credits, right. but you just get a, a lot of savings on your energy bill, and you're supporting the environment. So at your the same energy time. bill, in other words, if I was paying two hundred dollars a month for electricity, mm -hmm. it could be it could be that I, my monthly bill could go down to a hundred. Yeah. So you'll see, you'll you'll save on your bill, and you'll be supporting the environment. Like it's a win-win, right? And that's why people and local jobs. So so the yeah. the number of jobs that have been 
uh, developed here on island, mm -hmm. uh, developed on the Cape, are, are significant. I think there's uh, you know thousands of jobs across southeastern Massachusetts just due to solar mm -hmm. alone. Imagine what offshore wind will do. There's a lot of companies on the vineyard in particular that are just that are that. solar. And yeah. you know Massachusetts, we're the 35th sunniest state. Is that like right? you know, in January and 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 February, you see the sun like three times a month, right? Like we are not, <laughs> no, we are not even right, close right, to being right, the sunniest. Right, right. But we rank number two in solar jobs, number seven in solar output, and that is because uh, on the state level, we have some really terrific programs, and so that's a big part, I think, of what we do is encourage that, uh, and, and and not only encourage it but also expand on it. I got two questions yep. for you, but before I get to the the, the, the well, the biggie bigger. What are, we, what are we doing as a state to help Puerto Rico, Texas, Florida, and the rest of the Caribbean? So Massachusetts. And what would, yep. not only what are we doing, but going forward with energy mm -hmm. now, what would the state of Massachusetts encourage the, the, the federal government to do? What would you guys encourage the federal government to do? Go ahead. So I think, first of all, you, you can't see these storms uh, right. As a coastal community, right, and, and, right. and not relate to it. Right. I mean, we've we've had. I mean, I, Dylan and I were quite young, but I certainly remember Hurricane Bob. You know, oh, yeah. Um, oh yeah. You know, and, and I, I think got a that, tree not that, right? that's not there there. Oh, we had. Her. I mean, I, I thought it was great, right? Because I was a little kid, and there was all these, uh, you know, all these trees down. It was a playground, but you know, you can't help but look at that and think, you know, all right, what what level of preparedness, you know, do we have here in the Commonwealth? I'm actually quite confident uh, in both the state level and county levels of preparedness. Uh, that we have here. I know Massachusetts has sent teams from our emergency management agencies and others uh, yeah, to Texas and Florida. Florida. Right. The Coast Guard out of Woods Hole went yeah. down. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And I think just, you know, broadly, and I think you're seeing this in, in, in the Massachusetts de delegation, that when natural disasters happen, regardless if they're, you know, in our backyard or, 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 mm -hmm. or halfway across the country, you know, we have an obligation to support that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I expect you'll see support from Massachusetts uh, to help help these communities rebuild uh, because we know that uh, you know our communities have experienced and will experience mm -hmm. uh, natural disasters. I think it is really important that we address not only preparedness mm -hmm. but resiliency. Mm -hmm. So as we're talking about climate change, it makes a really big difference about how we're planning um, our harbors and what sort of barriers or seawalls we have. We're actually moving more to, to um, natural methods, right? The restoration of uh, embayments uh, and estuaries is really important around absorbing water. So, so we've got to make sure that we're working on that and keeping that up uh, in it whenever the next big storm is, whether it's next year or, or in the next 10 years. What about, what about as, we, as we see our, our electricity, is all, most of it is above the ground. And my wife and I were sitting talking. I said, how come they don't put the electricity underneath the ground in these containers, these pipes that are waterproof, that have stations at them so that when a storm comes, either water or wind, it's not going to affect the electricity. Now, how do you guys see that as far as, as, far as energy or whatever? It, I know it's expensive because mm -hmm. you're going to have to dig up everything, you know, the whole roads and whatnot. Right. But is something that's in the future, has that been talked about on the state level at all? I, you know, it's, it's not something that I've seen come up, but I think you raise a really good point and that, uh, you know, not only is it is it with the, is that a good idea for the storms that come through, but also just you know, it'll help beautify our area. Oh yeah, and you yeah, know you, you you're driving down a lot of kind of coastal areas in the district, and you see you know lines everywhere, totally. and it really kind of takes away from. I think it really takes away from it. And so there has been a push actually on island, and uh, Kaylee Moore, my legislative right, liaison, right. and I have been working on this along with Senator Sears' office about there are, and this is kind of tangential okay. to your okay. point, but there are a lot of people mm -hmm. on Martha's Vineyard who own their own utility lines. And the utility lines are not owned by the utility company. And so they bought a house not knowing this. And then 10 years, 15, 30, 40 years later, they find that they're not getting electricity and they're going to go fix the problem. And they realize that the utility, Eversource, doesn't own it. And so they're paying out of pocket Yee. tens of thousands of dollars. And this is a real issue on the island, something that a lot of people don't even aware that they're a part of, and, and people are slowly That's kind of- never bought into when the person's purchasing a house. Right, right, and some, and some of them didn't know. It is wrong, and so is wrong. what we did uh, along with Senator Sears' office is we reached out 
to the Attorney General's office because Eversource right now mm -hmm. is going around the Commonwealth asking for a rate increase. We're very much opposed to that. We know how hard it is uh, for people to pay their energy bills now as it is. And so we, we use this as a unique opportunity, not just to talk about the rate mm -hmm. hike, but to talk about vineyard residents yeah. and their private utility poles. Mm -hmm. And so we actually got the Attorney General's office to send a three-page report uh, to, uh, to, to DPU, right. um, asking them to take into account the private utility poles on the vineyard and make sure that Eversource takes those over. So that was a really big kind of win for the island. Great. And this part to get Great. the Attorney General's office, Great. which is the ratepayer advocate in the state, involved on this issue. Well, you and just picked up another 3,000 <laughs> votes for the next time. <laughs> for the next time you guys yeah. well, well, we, we'll, we'll still have work to do. We'll see what happens. You know, you yeah, know, and they haven't, and yeah. they're still going through the hearing process. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we're, we've been really pushing uh, for Eversource and other private utilities or, or quasi-private utilities to take over these, these yeah. polls because it's such an important pocketbook issue for people here on island. And it's, it, was, it was a big feat, and it speaks to the people at the Attorney General's office that they came on board right. and, and started really kind of advocating for Great. this as well. Question, last question. I saved myself last some question? time. Last Already? question? This is one of the last questions. This is going to take a time. Okay. Listen. The health care bill. I know when both of you guys came on when you were running, we discussed some of it, you know what I mean? And this is before, you know. Now, it's been, somebody said 61 times it failed before, and it just failed over the last three times. And now it's up again. With all the things that it says it, it, it isn't covering, and the 20 to 25 million people that would be affected by this. <clears throat> Tell me what your stands are. So for Massachusetts and the various proposals that have, that have come out, we're, we're talking about you know, a, a federal effort here around re repealing uh, the Affordable Care Act and, mm -hmm. and replacing it or not replacing it with something. Right. Uh, in Massachusetts, we estimate in the first year that if any of these plans went through, uh, the state would lose up to $2 billion uh, in matching federal funds. Uh, a big part of the debate is around how do we, do we move the Medicaid program, right, health care for the poor, but also health care for long-term care and the elderly, and also health care for and services for people who are pretty severely disabled. Do we move that away from, uh, all right, you have this many people on the plan, on your rolls, you're going to get a matching from the federal government, to just getting a block grant, a lump sum of money. So that would put us out $2 billion. This is not opposition and concern about this. Right. It's not a partisan thing in Massachusetts, right? The governor, uh, the attorney general, uh, Senate president, the speaker, we're all very concerned about that. I think the, the governor we, really showed his disapproval to, on two occasions. On, on multiple occasions, multiple occasions because, yeah. because it would be such a significant gap. Right. I think it is, I think, I think, I think now I, I think it's unlikely to move further at this point. Um, but closer to home in Massachusetts, we've got really big concerns we have to focus on around health care. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, mass health comprises 43% of our budget. The budget's the biggest thing as legislators we do every year, and we can talk about kind of what we've been able to get for the mm -hmm. island a little later, but um, you know, that amount is just growing. And so we're really trying to grapple with here in Massachusetts, how do you contain healthcare costs? How do you make sure that we continue uh, with access, right? 98% of residents, adults in Massachusetts have access to health insurance, this is a really big win, but how do you address that cost? And so uh, there, there's, been, um, there's been some back and forth going on. Uh, the governor made some proposals, which uh, the legislature, we had some concerns with. Uh, the Senate is actually taking up a bill uh, later this fall around looking around cost containment. Uh, I filed a bill, um, a single payer benchmark bill. So essentially, there's a lot of conversation. Well, if, if we had a single payer system, uh, this would be cheaper. If you look at the amount of money we're spending as a commonwealth on health care, it would, it would cost the equivalent of what, what it would take to have a single-payer mm. system. Uh, I filed a bill that essentially, it's a benchmarking bill, so what it says is over the next three years, the state would need to study uh, the, existing, the existing costs in our, the health care system we have now and what it would cost if we moved to a single-payer system. What, what, I mean, sure, you know, all, a lot of other countries have, have health care systems that are working. You know, Canada's got one. You got, you got, you know, uh, every, every, almost every developed country. Every, right, right. What is what is making it so difficult for us?
to go in, in some cases, adopt what they're doing that's, that's working. You know, I had a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, that was caught in um, uh, Spain. He was over there, and he got sick or something. He went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They took care of him completely, mm -hmm. <laughs> no bill, and sent him home. Right. Now, I'm saying to myself, well, wait a minute. Now, we're supposed to be bigger and wealthier and all that than Spain. How come he could go over there and get taken care of and get sent home with no bill? And people in our own country can't go to our mm -hmm. facilities and get treated like that without having to sell their kids, their houses, their dogs, their cars, their boats, and everything to pay the bill. What is it? What, Why, what, what I'm trying to say is what makes uh, the federal government legislators mm -hmm. opposed to get making it at least, if nothing else, for senior citizens who've paid their dues to, to, to ride out the rest of their life without having to worry about giving up everything? Right. No, it's a, that's a great question. I think it just goes to what are our values right. as a society. Right. And for, for Julie and I, that's, that's, that's pretty clear. We, we think that everyone, regardless of age, uh, sex, income, zip code, uh, you should be able to have access to health care. And you know, that is something that we as Democrats value. And, and one of the kind of, I guess, good things you could say coming out of uh, this push to repeal Obamacare is now uh, nationally Democrats are saying, are, are saying they want to look at and embrace single payer health care. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, we as a country will hopefully move to that. The biggest impediment to that is, frankly, Republicans <laughs> in, uh, in Congress. But I think we need to make the case as uh, even on the grassroots level, at the state level, that single payer is the way of the future. And it's, it's the best, it's, it speaks to our values as a country about lifting each other up and expanding healthcare access. Yeah. And in Massachusetts, uh, you know, at a time when Republicans in Congress were going like behind closed right, doors right, to right. put together a healthcare bill that would strip right. healthcare from millions and millions of right. Americans, you know, our governor, uh, Governor Baker has been really good uh, focused at the national level right. saying, no, don't repeal Obamacare. Right. But actually on the state level, he put forward a proposal that would have decreased health insurance and raised costs for 140,000 of the poorest people here in Massachusetts. He would have been, we would have been, the, if we didn't reject him we've, in we the legislature, we have blocked this, but if we didn't do that, if the Democrats and the Massachusetts mm -hmm. state legislature did not step up, we would have been the first state in the nation to roll back Medicaid expansion. So this is, you know, this is something that we're really Why vigilant about. That? That's a great I, question, well, Doctor. No, no, no. I, 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 on, on, the, on the federal oh, no. level, he, he's, he's saying, "Don't, we're not going to support that." But then he does something like that on the local level. Well, look, I, you know, the the excuse, and you hear this from, um, from you know, I guess the other side all the time is is the costs. And you know what? There are huge costs associated with our health health insurance, and we need to fix those costs. And that's why, when it comes to Obamacare. We don't want, you know, we agree it's not perfect, right? No, everybody Every day agrees no, it's right, not perfect, right. but don't scrap the whole thing. Let's Fix let's it. look at it. Let's tweak what's not working. Let's improve what is working. And you get a uh, flat tire in a car, you don't get rid of the whole yeah. car. You fix the flat tire. <laughs> I like you know, that. But you know, I yeah. think in Massachusetts as well, I really view the the healthcare issue. Right, Th this is a real cost and challenge for our businesses, especially small businesses here right. on island, right? And I think that in looking at um, a single single payer systems, and we actually have a very effective uh, system. It's called Medicare, and a lot of seniors really love it. And you know, it has flaws, and, and we also have uh, a, a great uh, healthcare program for veterans as well. So there's models of how to do this. Um, but for Massachusetts, and, and I grew up actually both of our both of us grew up in in small businesses here mm -hmm. uh, in the region. That that cost to our small business. Uh, around providing health insurance is very substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it uh, has contributed to a suppression of wages, right? We've seen flat wages for a really long time. Uh, and so here in Massachusetts, trying to look at this issue and talk about health care uh, really is something that, you know, is there a better way to do this? Uh, we think that there is. Mm -hmm. The bill that I filed, right, is, is, is looking to, to examine and study that. I, I, I think it would be, you know, I'm certainly, we're not certainly naive about mm -hmm. the fact that we've created such a knot Mm -hmm. of a mess in our healthcare system that mm -hmm. unraveling that is going to take quite a bit of time and energy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for the sustainability mm -hmm. of the state and for uh, a whole host of reasons, we really should be looking at this. Minute 30 seconds. Tell us something that we need to know that we don't know or something that you plan on doing that we need to know about. 
So the budget, which is one of the most important, biggest things we do. Okay. Um, both Rep, Rep Fernandez was tremendously successful in getting uh, resources for shellfish propagation. All right. uh, I worked on the house, on the Senate side around resources for homelessness mm -hmm. uh, efforts Ooh, yeah. here on island. Uh, the unfortunate thing with a number of these is that um, they were vetoed by the governor. Uh, and so I think it's, which is unfortunate, right? This is services for a uh, caseworker for the island, right, right. Uh, providing services uh, to help people get off island if they have certain medical needs. Uh, and so those were vetoed by, by the governor. I'm not really sure why. I think these are things that both Dylan and I really value. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're fighting to restore those. But I think uh, for islanders and for constituents, uh, writing in to, to our colleagues as well, especially uh, the, the respective chairs and ways and means would help uh, for us to take up those uh, vetoes and to override them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, the senator. And the uh, senator has been a terrific advocate for the vineyard and, and pushing for uh, more funding um, for a whole host of issues <laughs> that we're up against. And then the, the thing I want to highlight is I recently, I think two weeks ago, uh, filed a bill restricting pesticide use. Mm. Right. Uh, and, and so what it, what it does is it allows individual towns to further restrict pesticide use in our mm -hmm. state because we already have the regulations right. that are set. And so this would allow towns to go further and mm -hmm. say, you know what, our source, you can't spray uh, glyphosate on, on our backyards, which by the way, is a probable carcinogen right. that is banned in, right. <laughs> in the European <laughs> Union, right? And then it's also, you know, there's these things called neonicotinoids that are killing a lot of our bees, right? It's yeah. causing the, are killing our bees and our, our butterflies, our pollinators. And it would allow uh, a town like Oak Bluffs or, or Vineyard Haven, uh, any, any town in the state to go mm -hmm. a step forward and ban that pesticide use to help protect our environment, protect our agriculture yeah. and protect public health. Gentlemen, time is gone. It's quick. It's Listen, quick. I, I, I want to, you, you know, you have an open invitation. Thank Just you. Just have your, uh, your people call my people. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just give me a call and you're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank I'm you. glad of what you're doing. Thank you. You know, we're going to keep praying for you guys and make sure that you, you keep on there doing the thing that's good for the people. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. And thank you for coming thank on. You, thank you, Doctor. This is awesome. Thank you, Okay. Macri. All right. And thank you for tuning in to Tank Talk. Until next time, this is your host, Bob Tankard, saying good evening.